Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our next um, BOTSOC webinar. It's really lovely to be here. Um, and we're so excited to have today's panel. Uh, just a little bit of introduction about the Botanical Society, but most of you would have come here through our platforms. We're a civil society body who's tasked with the awesome responsibility of knowing, growing, protecting, and enjoying South Africa's indigenous plants. And um, these webinars are just one way of how we want to give our members and members of the public information that they can use about our plants. Um, and I think also importantly, we want to transform South Africa's relationship with our plants. But um, today, we're very fortunate that we've got a fantastic panel of not just um, plant restoration specialists, but also BOTSOF members. So we're keeping it in-house. And um, we're very um, keen to see what, what, uh, what we're going to hear. I just also wanted to say that um, if you hadn't caught our first webinar on the extinction threats to South Africa's plants, um, go and check it out on our website, www.botanicalsociety.org.za. Um, as well as on our YouTube channel. So I would suggest that if you want to catch um, these, these webinars going forward um, or, or look at them later and share around to people, uh, use YouTube, it's the, it's the easiest one. And um, I also just want to, at this stage, acknowledge um, the, the team that's been behind the planning of this. So, you know, the idea came about last year. We had a sit down with um, members of council, uh, crew and Sandy, um, and our own conservation committee. And, and so we've got a list of topics that we're working our way through, but I'm not going to give them all to you at this moment in time. So stay tuned so that you can, you can see them all. Um, but also just from a technical point of view, um, a lot of the, the visuals that we have from that I'm sharing from my side is from Love Green. And we've also had a lot of technical assistance from Zoom experts up in Pretoria, um, Vetlink. So thank you to those people for, for assisting us. Um, the, the last thing from a housekeeping point of view is that uh, after this meeting, we'll have a 15 minute break and there'll be a follow up, um, what shall we call it, a hangout essentially, uh, or after party as Paul would say, um, where we can uh, have a more unstructured one um, that won't be, be streamed live. So then we can talk a bit more freely. Um, as well as as just meet each other. I think in this moment in time, it's always good to have additional uh, additional places of contact between people with shared interests. But I think um, if you're not yet the Botanical Society member, uh, this is the time when um, remember we all our four panelists are the Quatsock members, and it would be a great thing if more people using um, or enjoying this talk could go in and join us as well, because uh, we, we're gearing up to do really great things in the plant conservation and plant appreciation space. And um, we need you to come and join us and help us across the country. We, we're lucky to have a national footprint and um, we'd like to have people across South Africa to have access to this information and to the kind of specialist skills that, that we do through our members and through our partnerships. So I'm going to... Um, Stop talking now and uh, well, first introduce our first speaker. Um, so, Dr. Pat Holmes is a, a, a well known name down in the Cape. Um, she's also on our conservation committee at Botsock, and um, she's got many, many, many degrees, <laughs> but um, the most recent one is a PhD from UCT in Botany. Um, she's got a, a, a background, um, also including education, and moved to Cape Town in 1984 and then discovered the Cape Flora. And she's been um, pushing um, the envelope in terms of knowledge of the Cape Flora and things that threaten it ever since. Um, and the great thing about Pat is she's got a lot of practical experience with um, alien removal, what happens after aliens come in, and then... Um, also, she's got experience in terms of being um, in and outside of the state. So, so uh, where she's worked with the city of Cape Town until recently. And so that breadth of experience, um, and then she's put it, she puts things together in a way which is really simple. And um, uh, when she's not doing um, 
things such as supervising at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, so she's an extraordinary professor there. Um, she works through a consultancy in Cape Ecological Service. So Pat, um, if you could please uh, share your calls of wisdom for us, and I, I look forward to the baseline that it will put to our discussion. Thank you very much. All right, I'm now I can see it. Oh, there we and go. is it all right on your side? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Rupert, for the introduction, and good afternoon to everybody. I'm going to talk about ecological restoration and the potential role of the Botanical Society, but essentially this is just an introduction to ecological restoration. So all the slides that I'll show will be of degraded vegetation, so you can just look out as to what you see and what the degrading factor might be. So for example, this title slide shows Blauberg Nature Reserve, which is managed by the city of Cape Town. And this aerial image was taken in 2020, two, um, 2013, when the city started a major restoration program. And you can see that uh, the, there's, uh, well, at the reserve, there's critically endangered vegetation, about 400 hectares of Cape Flat sand fainboss that's been densely invaded by alien trees, especially Acacia sligna. And, and this is also a site of ecological restoration research. First of all, then, what is ecological restoration? The SER, or the Society for Ecological Restoration, defines it as the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. But there are different levels of degradation. And I find this infographic that the SER produced very useful. This is the restorative continuum. So it shows the whole range of degradation. So for example, on the left-hand side, you see an ecosystem that's totally destroyed under urban development. In other words, it's just concreted over. And here, all one can really do is reduce any impacts such as pollution, but one's not gonna restore that. On the other end, at the right-hand side, you've got a fully recovering native ecosystem. So that might have been degraded by overstocking with livestock or invasive alien trees, for instance, and just removing those impacts has allowed the system to fully recover. But generally speaking, the dotted line shows the, the um, start of ecological restoration on the right. Um, so usually the soils are still intact and there might be some native seed banks, but there may be different levels of intervention required, but essentially you're going to be restoring the ecosystem structure and functioning at least. Whereas on the left, it's probably not possible to do that without huge cost. And there you might be repairing an ecosystem uh, function such as soil erosion control and water purification. And that one would generally term as rehabilitation. We're now in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Last year, the General Assembly of the United Nations declared 2021 to 2030 the decade on ecosystem restoration. So why now? Well, essentially we're at a critical point on the earth where we're losing biodiversity at a tremendous rate. And it's a, there's a realization we have to do more to try and halt this. And secondly, we're in a climate change crisis. And I think there's greater understanding now of the important role that natural ecosystems play in sequestering carbon. And if we can restore ecosystems, we could help to mitigate this climate change. So how did we get into this biodiversity crisis? Well, I think that we're all aware of the, the human population growth and the, the increasing use of um, resources. But I thought it was well summarized in the, the WWF Living Planet report last year. And this is available for download off the internet. It's worth having a look at. Rather alarming statistics, but 75% of the Earth's ice-free land surface has been significantly altered, either lost or degraded. And this includes over 85% of wetland area that we've lost. Most of our oceans are polluted and over 1 million species are now threatened with extinction. And in last month's webinar, you heard a bit about South Africa's threatened flora. But the report also states that many extinctions are preventable 
if we conserve and restore nature. They also produced this very interesting summarizing graph. I thought it was a, a useful way to look at humanity's footprint. So they express it in terms of billions of global hectares required to absorb humanity's impact. So on the y-axis, you see billions of global hectares, and on the x-axis, the time span from 1961 to the present. The green dotted line shows the world's biocapacity, and the other colors are the various humanities footprints. So for example, the purple is the carbon footprint, which you can see has increased dramatically. And at the bottom, the yellow is our cropland footprint. And you can see that we actually exceeded the world's biocapacity around 1970. So we're really not on a sustainable path and something has to change. And hence the need for ecological restoration. Furthermore, the Society for Ecological Restoration notes that global society must secure a net gain in the extent and functioning of native ecosystems by investing in both environmental protection and ecological restoration. And this repair must be implemented at multiple scales to achieve me measurable effects worldwide. In other words, we mustn't just wait for national and regional restoration programs. We all need to get involved and, and to make a difference at a, a local level. And secondly, it's no longer enough just to conserve areas. We're still losing natural ecosystems. We have to do more than trying to protect what's left. Um, hence ecological restoration. And Bernardo Strasberg of the International Institute for Sustainability, he noted that ecological restoration is a very powerful tool for global challenges, and we can reduce global species extinction debt. We can sequester significant amounts of CO2 and help to limit global warming. And this can be done cost effectively compared to other methods. Just to note, to be aware of the, there's a huge global attention on afforestation as a means to mitigate climate change, but afforestation is not appropriate everywhere. And obviously it's important for areas that were previously forest, but for instance, in South Africa, we've got savannas, grasslands and shrublands, and here planting up with trees is not necessarily appropriate. And furthermore, we've got a, a huge legacy from afforestation in the past afforestation with exotics such as pines, wattles and gums to meet our timber needs. And these have resulted in severe alien tree invasions that have negatively impacted on our biodiversity, our ecosystem services, and the ability of our ecosystems to adapt to climate change and also mitigate it. And there's a couple of useful publications that have come out dealing with this issue. Um, at the moment, there's a global conference carrying on out of Kew called um, Afforestation um, biodiversity and climate change. And they are also making the point that one must be careful what trees to plant, that it's not always appropriate to use exotics. So what is BOTSOC's role in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration? And this is up for discussion, but just to note that we have a conservation strategy seen on the left, and this very much supports South Africa's strategy for plant conservation. And within that, there are already some restoration related ac activities that need to be done. For example, object objective two, plant diversity is urgently and effectively conserved, including by restoration actions through effective management. So improving de the degradation forces that are going on um, through effective management is one way to restore the ecosystem. Another one is to have some of our threatened plants in ex situ collections, either seed banks or rootstock, so that we can restore them to the wild. And also to prevent new degradation coming in, so new biological invasions, for instance. And I think that Botsock should probably focus on the important plant areas, the IPAs. These are areas with a high density of threatened species, because currently the the natural resource management programs, such as working for water, they focus on areas delivering ecosystem services, such as water. And often, unfortunately, our important plant areas fall outside of that. So we need more focus on the important plant areas, both for, for conservation and restoration. But probably Botsock could do more, um, perhaps through partnerships, um, helping other um, 
conservation agencies and um, private reserves to restore important habitats if they fall into important plant areas. And this can be through passive restoration. And by that, I mean removing the degradation factor or reducing it, such as alien invasions or an inappropriate fire regime. And already many BOTSOC members are involved in this, but also through active restoration in some cases, um, through restoring the main growth forms of the vegetation, if they're highly degraded, and also maybe introducing threatened species where this is required to augment non-viable populations. So those are just some ideas up for discussion, how BOTSOC could be um, helping with this, helping to reduce our extinction debt. Um, but just to note that members are already involved in many of these interventions, and I'll just finish off with a slide from the Kuchelberg branch hackers who are busy restoring coastal fynbos vegetation by removing the aliens. This is the most important intervention. Get in there while there's still good recovery potential of the felt um, and you're making a, a significant difference. So thank you for listening. And here I'm finishing off with a slide of Blyberg Nature Reserve, five years after the initial treatment you saw with some of the fynbos coming back and in the foreground, a critically endangered plant, Cerulea trilofa. So, it's expensive, it's time consuming, but one can make a difference. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, lots of food for thought. Um, I, th I think uh, just to, to give um, a little bit of extra to what you were saying is that Botsak, uh, we've just presented this morning at the IUCN national members meeting. Um, that we're busy working on the 12 or 13 golden rules of restoration as, as a, um, an introduction to people interested in this field of what some of the core tenants are uh, that you've mentioned and, and that balance between protection of habitat and then um, restoration as well as um, when to plant trees and when not to plant trees is an important conversation that we're going to keep on having um, going forward. Um, okay, so I'm going to now introduce our next distinguished speaker. This is the lovely thing about um, working at Botsock is that you, you get to uh, work with both members as well as people that, that you respect very deeply. Um, so from one person like that to the next is um, Dr. Sue Milton Dean, who is a plant ecologist with 40 years worth of experience. Um, she's got broad, broad background. Um, doing resource assessments um, in most of the biomes across the country um, and, and um, is, has retired, uh, well, retired in, in inverted commas to work very hard at Prince Albert, um, uh, doing, doing all sorts of interesting things from a restoration and conservation point of view. And the good thing about Sue is when you drive through Prince Albert, you can actually see the fingerprints all over the town in terms of the, the plants that have come out of the nursery at the new Karoo. So to the real champion for indigenous plants and, and also understanding systems as well as education. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Sue. And we look forward to um, you. your presentation from, from um, to give us some pointers about how we get hands on with restoration in the Namakaru. I'm looking for the share screen. There it goes, share screen. So hopefully I'm sharing the screen now with everybody. Can everybody see the presentation? Yeah, it's coming through. You just need to make it full screen. Okay. Okay, full screen now. So thanks everyone. And I'm going to focus on restoration in the arid part of the country, doing any kind of repairs to damaged environments in arid areas is very, very challenging because it's only really one in 10 years where the rainfall is sufficient for anything to grow. In this little presentation, I'm going to focus on what to plant in terms of the biome you're in, the lie of the land and the soil type, and then how to prepare the site, and then how to protect your considerable investment. So 
as you know, this is the Fainboss biome, and many, many BOTSOC members will know about that. And then as you go further inland and up and down the Namakwaland coast and through the Clan Karoo, there's the succulent Karoo biome. And if you venture further inland and onto the higher plateau, you're in the Nama Karoo area. And when you think about restoration of Karoo, you need to be fairly clear about what you're trying to restore. Don't try to introduce something like fanboard plants to the succulent Karoo or succulents to the Nama Karoo because it simply won't work and they're not appropriate for that area. Moreover, you need to think about what part of the landscape you're going to restore and what would be appropriate for that landscape. So here's a picture of the long narrow valley of Dehel, which is in the Swartberg Mountains. This is a north facing steep slope. This is a south facing steep slope and this is a riparian area. The whole of the north facing hot sunny dry slope is covered with speckworm, this pale green that you see. And on the other side, the cooler south facing slope, even under the same rainfall and with the same soil type, is dominated by Renostafeld. So don't go planting speckworm everywhere just because it's speckworm, because it's going to get frosted to death on the south facing slope. It's really only appropriate on the north facing slope. Then within your landscape, even if you're working on an absolutely flat plain, you need to consider soil type. So the soil surface could be very stony, it could be very sandy, or it could be silty with a lot of biological crust and maybe quartz pebbles. And these three soil types would need very different plants to be sown or introduced. So you would expect mostly non succulent shrubs here on the sandy soil. You would expect grasses, particularly the Stipogrustus or Bushman grass species. And on the silty soils, if you were in the succulent crew, you could expect very specialized succulents, which would be hard to come by. So in summary about what to introduce. It's not about what you find attractive. It's not about what your game or livestock want to eat really, or even about what captures the most carbon. What you introduce should be what grows in that region or biome in that particular landscape, depending on the north or south slope or whether it's in a valley and on what soil type you intend to plant. And if you, consider these things carefully and select the right kinds of plants, your efforts will persist over a long time. If you introduce something inappropriate, they will not. The next point is how to prepare the site. So we take our lessons from the art frog and the art frog eats termites and ants, so it does a lot of digging. It digs these little or not so little um, hollows this is one that I photographed in 2018. It's about 30 centimeters deep and you can see some plants are establishing in it. In 2021, I re-photographed this hollow and you can see the plants have increased in diversity and in size, despite the six year drought that is killing all the vegetation in the surrounding area. This is because the kind of diggings that art folk make capture resources that being run off of the little rainfall. They protect the plants from wind, they shade the plants, and they also trap litter, which is a good source of nutrients. So when we do restoration in these very harsh environments, we imitate artifact diggings by making hollows about half a meter across and about 15 centimeters deep, to which we add seeds and some organic mulch. We often also put branches over the top to protect the plants from grazing and to encourage birds to perch on them and bring in additional seeds. And sometimes we introduce seeds as well as the other organic materials. And this is a particular area where we worked with students from 2016 onwards. You can see the gradual buildup of vegetation over that time. Nothing happens fast in this environment. So don't lose heart. The other thing you see is that in natural vegetation, plants are in clumps. 
that are multi-species. So here's an aloe and some fahis and a shrub all growing together. The way the clump, clumps form is that the wind blows seed into the clump and the seed falls off there and it, that gives the seed an excellent and protected site to start life. Here's some restoration being done in the Karoo National Park. And in order to achieve this clumping effect in the long term, they've put lots of litter traps over the hollows that they've dug. And you can see clumps of diverse species beginning to germinate and develop inside the hollows where the seeds have been brought both by wind and birds. One of the important things to remember is that your restoration efforts can be undone if upslope from your restoration work, there is soil erosion. So it's a very good idea if you're working on a slope to first stabilize the soil's upslope using little nets or branch packings. So in summary, the way to prepare the site, it's all about trapping resources, trapping water, nutrients, and seeds, and then retaining those resources so that flash floods and wind and movement of soil don't wash all that away again. So it's important then to protect your resource by stabilizing the ground. And you should go about this in the right way. Don't somehow throw a few tires in the dongas. You need to carefully construct keyed in erosion weirs that go from one bank of the donga to the other and are permeable to water so that water will move through them, depositing silt behind it, retaining water a bit longer and not flowing rapidly through the donga, but also not being blocked by your erosion structure and not finding an alternative pathway to erode around it. You also need to protect your work by excluding anything that's going to damage young plants. And that means keeping livestock out of restoration sites. That is sheep and goats, also uh, ostrich and larger game. If you let them onto a restoration site, they will target young shooting plants and soon kill the plants before they're strong enough and deeply rooted enough to establish. And finally, if there's any chance of invasive alien plants moving into your damaged site that you're trying to restore, they will certainly find your nice protected hollows and move into them. So alien plants in the vicinity need to be cleared before, long before attempting any restoration in these areas. So in summary, the best way to protect a site while you're busy restoring it is prevent damage to new plants, prevent soil and wind erosion, keep out anything that's going to trample or graze the plants, including tourists, not that they graze the plants, but you don't want people walking on the site and clear away alien invasive plants. And that's about it, thank you. Thanks so much, Sue. So um, I, I think the main not the main, there are so many great strands out of that presentation, but um, specifically that long observation of animals and habitat in order for us to do whatever is, is appropriate for an area is something that we really need to do more of across the country. So thanks for that example. Um, we're going to move now from somewhere very dry uh, to somewhere quite wet. Um, and our next speaker is Phil McLean, um, also known on social media as Fainbos Phil, who works uh, at the Department of the Western Cape Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning. Um, he's a task manager for riparian rehabilitation, management, and bioremediation, which he summarizes as um, making rivers great again. So this work is very applied. Um, using a lot of the same principles that, that uh, Sue's mentioned now. So um, I'm keen to see what Paul's got to share with us. Uh, go ahead and share and do your thing, Paul. Thanks, Rupert. Um, I told Rupert uh, that I needed 25 minutes for this presentation. <clears throat> so he promptly cut my head off the promo flyer. So I'm going to try and stick to my five minutes because I don't know what else he's going to cut off. 
So I'm going to be necessarily brief, um, um, but please feel free to ask questions um, and I'll get to as many as we can. <clears throat> right, so the Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning has put together this program called the Berg River Improvement Plan. Uh, we function on the Berg and the Breeder technically, but uh, for the Berg River Improvement Plan, we've appointed Intaba <clears throat> Environmental Services as the contractor. So what do we do? We approach landowners that have riparian infestations of uh, normally tree invaders, um, and we ask for a kind of a buy-in. Uh, the buy-in is, is material in that they must provide uh, money or a uh, irrigation service typically. Uh, we found that this buy-in method works a, a lot better than a, a charitable thing. So working for water come in and clear invasives, but <clears throat> many landowners don't keep the follow-up like they should. So this kind of emotional buy-in helps the landowner to be a bit more invested in the project. Just to give you an idea of the scale of some of the tree invasions in the riparian areas, this is the one site that we were looking at from above a second ago. Trees, tree invaders of riparian areas are a triple bad whammy. Um, we all know about the, the, the theft of water that they have from, from abstraction, but uh, they also alter the soil chemistry and, and microbiology. And here you'll see an effect of the trees, just the mass of trees planted or growing up next to each other, forces the river into a narrow channel, which causes it to erode deeply and in size. Um, and that incision often drops the, the, the bed of the river quite low down. Um, and this can have the effect um, of actually starting to drain the groundwater in that area rather than rivers recharging groundwater through braided systems. So they turn the hydrology on their head. So obviously the first port of call is we have to remove them um, because we're not uh, operating big areas like working for water, we can be a little bit more adaptive in our removal methodologies. Here you'll see some of the large standing trees are ring barked, so they will die standing. They provide some structural height for things like roosting raptors, but also uh, things like, um, in this case, providing a slight screening to the road uh, from the properties alongside this river that would otherwise be quite rapidly exposed to a major highway um, and you would give some time for the understory to grow up in the rehab section and then this is no longer a problem. You'll see this is uh, something that uh, Pat touched on but uh, there's the, the issue with plant and tree invaders is that they can alter the soil microbiology um, and this can give rise to secondary invasions um, and what Johan from Entaba calls a lucky packet, where you get a whole lot of things coming back um, in the space that you want to rehabilitate, not necessarily the things you want. Some of these secondary invaders can be more difficult to eradicate than the or original tree invader. So that brings in the second phase of our project, which is the active rehabilitation that Pat was talking about. We try to restore some structural components and elements back into this landscape on purpose to kind of steer that um, succession into the direction we wanted to go. To that end, Intaba are contracted to provide 120,000 seedlings per year into the rehab sites. And this is one of their awesome nurseries uh, that they are growing these, these um, seedlings for us. And then here they are putting them out on site. This site's about two years old of post clearing. Uh, you'll see the grasses came back really quickly in this area. And that's kind of part of the problem. You can't even see the irrigation pipes that snake uh, across underneath here. But those have kept the uh, planted elements alive. And I just point them out to you now. They're popping up above the grass now. And this shot was taken two or three weeks ago. So they are well into surviving the summer. So that's, that's good to see. We are also experimenting on, on ways to up the survivability. And, and now this is quite similar to, to Sue's um, um, idea with the, the artwork holes, but we've got these little dummies. There's more than just the dummies, there's an experimentation going on. All of these dummies are multi species uh, troughs. And then the experimentation is some of these are watered uh, once or twice a month, some not at all. Some of them have been uh, inoculated with biochar, some not. 
um, and we'll see how we go. And then, you know, part of the idea of this as well, if you if you plant out species in a, in a space in individual holes, they're competing with the secondary invader or um, disturbance weeds or whatever comes up next. So each of them has a chance of surviving, but a chance of dying. Uh, and there, there's competition going on. If you plant them all together in a mixed species hole like this, you get the same kind of competition happening, but the winner will be something that you've planted. If only one species survives in this pit, at least it was the thing that you planted. So you're steering your ecology in the way that you want it. And just to give you an idea of how well this is working, this site, this was taken in about August, and this was about last week. Um, and quite interestingly, there, there has not been the kind of uh, competition that I would have expected. So all of the species, the, the herbaceous and the shrub element are still alive and well in there, and the tree components are being protected in amongst uh, everything else. So it's going along very nicely. Um, here again in August, and uh, you wonder why the sticks are there, because surely it's obvious where the plants are, but as soon as the grass and the weeds come up, that kind of disappears. So, but here they are coming up in the little dummies. Uh, on the Cape Kairos site. Obviously a big part of this, of the, the labor that goes into this is, is post clearing weeding. So there's just not just the normal clearing. You have to come back in and make sure that the uh, adventitious uh, weeds and, and uh, secondary invaders and whatever are maintained at a low density or low height so that they don't start impacting your plantings. So in essence, we are in the business of turning this muck into this. Thanks very much. Thanks, Will. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's awesome to see that work. Um, and I think we'll, we'll share one of those uh, in Tower videos to, uh, to support this information later on as well, because um, the hands-on work that's being done there is, is good. And it's, it's excellent to see that government private landowner triangle kind of getting together and, and sorting out our ecosystems that need attention. Great. So. Um, we, I'm just aware of, of time and all your fantastic questions, um, but I just want to introduce our last uh, speaker, of, sort of the formal speaker for this session. Um, so Isabel, if you could switch your video on and get ready. Um, so Isabel Johnson is uh, someone that I have the privilege of working with uh, quite closely because um, she's the botanical conservation uh, specialist up in KZN, supported by Botsock. Um, and, and not just goes in, but all the eastern regions of the country. So she's got a, quite a big portfolio. Um, she's been a fan of these grasslands for more than 20 years and spends lots of time in field where more, much more of us should be counting forbs and collecting seed and so forth. And um, she's pivotal in grassland conservation in the eastern regions, as well as being a um, member of the Botsock branch up there in Kaiser in inland, um, she until recently, but still they are serving on the branch. So it's very good to have you here, Isabel, and to share some of your experiences um, where we move now from a systems point of view to some of the species that we have. Can you see that, Rupert? Yes. Hello? Oh, sorry, yes, I see can. it very well. Thank you. Oh, great. <laughs> OK, well. This is full screen, please. Presentation mode. Um, sorry? Yeah, that's it. OK, well, hi, everybody. It's great to have you all listening to the fascinating work that we're doing. And thanks so much to the last three excellent speakers who've laid an amazing background and gone into far more detail than I'm going to go into. Um, I will be talking about conserving species and restoring moist grasslands in the eastern part of South Africa, um, and more specifically about forming partnerships and working with a lot of conservation agencies. So just to quickly recap what Pat 
Holmes was saying about Botsock's role in plant restoration and conservation, um, we are really working to protect our remaining threatened flora by ex situ conservation, important plant areas, and biodiversity stewardship, as well as active restoration by um, actively planting threatened and common species back into degraded landscapes. Um, we, I'm based with a KZN inland branch, branch in the Midlands of Natal. So we are surrounded by a threatened vegetation type, the mistbelt grassland, which is a very species rich moist grassland. Um, here is a, a view of a very beautiful harebell or diorama in a little strip of mistbelt grassland. Unfortunately, this grassland is really um, threatened by forestry, by urban development, by agriculture, by alien um, invasion. And the patches that are left are more and more becoming focal points for livestock grazing. So there's an awful lot of degradation of the remaining fragments. So as I've just said, this area is highly modified. What's left is rapidly disappearing through grazing and weed invasion. And we desperately need to save these grassland patches and their special species. And we really want to share this with as many people as we can. And we're hoping to, and we've started to do this through our Botsock branch. And we are working very closely with the KwaZulu-Natal National Botanical, the Sandby Garden in Peter Maritzburg as well as with the local conservation agencies and conservation NGOs in the area. Um, just to show you what happens when areas are overgrazed, this is a classic slide taken by the well-known KZN botanist, Rob Scott Shaw. And on the left, you can see a quite heavily grazed grassland with only a few really tough species still flourishing, whereas on the right of the fence is an area that hadn't, hasn't been grazed for many years and is very species rich and high in palatable grasses. And this is what we would like to aim to restore our grasslands to. So what is Botsock doing about this? As I said, we're working very closely with the KwaZulu Garden, collecting seeds of threatened species. Here is a picture of myself and Batabile, who's the threatened plant horticulturalist at the gardens, um, bagging flower heads of an endangered Tifrosia species so that we can come back and collect the seed, which we have done, and it's growing, germinating and growing beautifully. Um, and we're collecting these seeds both for the ex situ collections in the garden and for the Millennium Seed Bank and for our restoration projects. Um, added to this, we are using the botanical and ecological skills and considerable experience of many of our Botsock members. Um, and we're helping to guide and mentor many of the garden workers with um, plant conservation work. And thirdly, I'm quite involved with biodiversity stewardship in KwaZulu-Natal. And biodiversity stewardship sites are ideal areas in which to do restoration because you can give management recommendations um, to do with the grazing and the burning regimes in areas which we're trying to restore which means that you can have quite a controlled grazing program, which is most conducive to allowing introduced special species to survive and thrive. So the restoration part of our project is just getting off the ground. And as just to recap, we are planning to use degraded areas in biodiversity stewardship sites um, where we will be introducing locally, very locally um, sourced, both threatened and common plants. 
which we'll reintroduce using seed and seedlings with very careful protocols. Um, and we're hoping to restore the rich species um, suites in these grasslands, in these restoration areas, by working very closely with the landowners um, with very careful management. Um, and as I say, this part of the project is right at the beginning, but it's really fantastic to be able to share with you that we as Botsok are doing something really meaningful in the eastern grasslands of the country. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, and I hope you spotted my Hilton daisies in the last picture, because I'm doing quite a lot of research with them and reintroducing them. And thank you all for listening. Thanks, Isabel. Always lovely to see those daisies. <laughs> um, I'm just uh, reminding everyone that we, we, are, we want to end just on sex. So there's fantastic questions that have come through. I'm copying them and, uh, so that we can continue the conversation on the more unstructured Zoom meeting afterwards. I've pasted the link in the chat. Uh, it's on Facebook as well. Um, but there's one or two questions that, uh, that I do want us to get to. And if the panelists could just uh, put their, their videos on as well. Um, I think my, my first question is for Sue. So um, Sue, we, I mean, we've had this conversation, but uh, can you both explain the importance of um, locally indigenous uh, material for these restoration, as well as the kind of difficulty of um, our current management of open spaces and road verges and so forth, um, is making it for people like yourselves to get that material for, for restoration? Yes, sure. So one of the things that our business does is to employ people to collect seeds of common plants along road verges. We also grow some grasses in orchards, but the most useful seeds are the most common things in the Karoo. So we collect seeds such as bushman grass, Stapagrosta species, uh, thimble grass, Fingeruthia, and other really common ones. And these we can send to various parts of the Karoo where people want to do restoration and engineering and other projects without worrying too much about the genotypes. So unfortunately, the way that road verges are managed these days is that they are cleared sometimes right up to the fence by scuffling and use of herbicides. That means there are very few grasses to be collected along road verges. And it seems such a shame to me that people couldn't make a living for themselves by collecting seeds, um, not on the very edge of the tar. Obviously, that has to be kept clear to preserve our roads, but a little in from the tar. And we would be happy to buy them or to advise people how they can sell them. But instead, we're just wiping out these potential conservation areas. So the other part of your question was, where should you get seed for restoration? And it depends very much what you're trying to plant and what you're trying to restore. So if it's a widespread plant, such as some of the grasses, you could probably buy it from someone collecting it in a different part of the Karoo. However, if you are trying to put back, particularly uh, members of the Fahey family, these often have tiny little distribution ranges and it would be very inappropriate to buy, for example, fahis from Prince Albert and sow them in Springbok. That just is not done. So if you're working with narrow range endemics, plants limited to a certain area, you need to collect your seed locally. And that is quite challenging because of unpredictable rainfall. Luckily, many of the mesembryanthemums have seeds that last for some years. If you're working, however, with daisies, which have very oily seeds, they only last for two or three years, and you need to collect them, keep them for a couple of years under cool, dark conditions, and then unfortunately throw them away. So it, it, there isn't one rule that applies to everything, in my opinion. Cool, but um, that's, that's a good point of discussion to start. Um, 
Sorry, guys, I'm going to ask Pat the next question too. I'm not Pat, sorry, Sue, the next question too, because it was such an interesting one. Um, would, it was from Bronwyn Trafford. Would the art fog technique work in the subtropical thicket as it is also an arid area? Yes, but it wouldn't lead to any regeneration of speckworm. So you would need to plant the speckworm. The reason that I say that is speckworm does flower very well, particularly after it's been droughted and then there's rain in the warm season. And it makes these tiny little papery seeds, which are not great germinators and don't move around very far. So the best way to quickly reestablish speckworm is from truncheons. Uh, the jury's still out as to whether putting little dummies around your truncheons will work or not. But what the dummies will do at least is to trap grass seeds so that before the speckworm forms a dense thicket in say 20 years, you at least have some diversity of other plants covering the soil surface. Okay, cool. Um, I think I actually want to open up to the panelists. Is, is there any spark that, that's come to you from, from one of the other presentations that you want to engage with? Taking pause. <laughs> um, I, I think, Pat, uh, this question is for you from Gustav. Um, in terms of connecting these islands of biodiversity hotspots that are isolated and fragmented, how can corridors be used to connect the systems and the ecosystems that they, uh, ecosystem services that they offer? Okay, thanks. Um, well, a bit of I think we have to go back to our biodiversity planning and looking at where the remnants are and where the there's potentially degraded areas in between. And then one would have to work with landowners and the broader community to find out where one could get permission to come in and do restoration work. Um, one would obviously start with having identified the suitable areas, one would have to first bring in the vegetation structural components. So in a shrubland, you'd be looking at your, your herbaceous species and your shrub, woody shrubby species. Um, at least that would get some functioning going. And if you're dealing with a fire driven system, it needs to be able to carry fire um, so that you can reinstate that. So it's quite a lot to think about. And I think it's, you know, it is an important point that we have to involve all the stakeholders in that. Good. Yeah, so I, I think um, partnerships is definitely the name of the game um, because there's so much work that's required in this space and without the coordination as has been shown by full um, talk and also Isabel, we, we, we find the botanical and biodiversity and restoration people from different backgrounds working together, then we're not going to get anywhere. So um, as a former colleague of mine used to say, teamwork makes the dream work. And, and I think it's also just that, that thing that we learn about plants, um, that plants learn us actually about how the more diverse a community is, the stronger it is. Um, I, are there any final um, thoughts from the panel? Um, because we've got three minutes left because before I close this leg of, of the proceedings, um, and I do just want, need 30 seconds right at the end. Okay. Yeah, just following on from that, we do, we do need the expertise. We need to know how to grow these things and how to get them to germinate in the field. So we need the, the ecological side. But for the broader landscape scale planning, that's where you need to bring in all the other players. Yeah. And I don't know where Botsock could play a role, but that's something to think about. Yeah. No, I think uh, our co coordination role, because of the fact that we are national, is, is key, and we, we do want to play that linkage as, as far as possible. Um, Isabel, there's a question for you quickly. Um, with regards to stewardship sites in degraded areas in KZN, is Botsock open to suggestions from members or interested parties in the establishment of new ones? And if so, what would manage such a, 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 managing such a site entail? And I know this, that's like a two-hour answer from you, but can you squeeze it into a minute? <laughs> Um, if you're talking about um, getting 
degraded sites declared as stewardship conservation areas, um, it depends a little bit because obviously um, stewardship is concentrating on the important um, biodiversity areas. So we'd rather put our efforts into um, conserving what has got value than, than areas with a very low biodiversity value. But most of the areas, most farms um, or land holdings or community areas do have some good areas and some not so good areas. So you know, we, we're planning to start the restoration on, on the not so good areas within stewardship sites where we've got a little bit of a handle on management. Um, but yeah, certainly we would be very interested in, in chatting to people who've got degraded areas that they're wanting to restore. It would be, it would be great. So please, if you can contact me, we can talk further. Yeah, I would suggest that people go to our website at botanicalsociety.org.za and see where our branches are. There's a map there. Um, and um, I'm just partially ans answering this uh, question, which is in the chat, about how, um, from Elizabeth Carruthers, how one could work with municipalities on restoration and rehabilitation. Um, I think uh, the, the key is from our side is, as we're trying to establish those connections, um, look at your local Brotsock branch um, and interact with the conservation portfolio person there and, and they'll put us all in touch because the coordination of, of volunteers is definitely what we're really interested in. Um, so um, I think we're just off the six and I want to respect everyone's time and thank you so much for joining us and putting up with our um, technical hitches. Um, one last thing, please go and if you don't already follow us on the various social media platforms, um, WhatsApp Instagram is great guns, especially if you like flowers. Um, our Facebook uh, page is where we, we share all of these things. Um, I want to uh, individually thank all the speakers for, for really illuminating us in, and having that golden thread going through it and also for being good and regular standing members of WhatsApp. So that's too... Pat, Paul, and Isabel, thank you for your contributions, and we look so forward to, to working with you into the future. Um, and then just a little plug for our, our next webinar um, is that it happens on um, Thursday, the 25th of uh, March, so it's the last Thursday of each month, and the next theme would be citizen science and drilling down to iNaturalist, because we, we're leading up to the city, uh, the International City Nature Challenge, at the end of April. So we, we want to both profile what South African citizen scientists have done so far and how they are world leaders, as well as um, give information to a, a whole new cohort of people to go out there and help us record South Africa's plant. So thank you for paying attention and um, we'll see you at quarter past six in the other meeting or at the next webinar or on our various platforms. Take care and have a good evening. Bye. <laughs>